Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The lesson today was that God Himself will wipe away all tears. Very beautiful. <laughs> that He's just teaching us that the only reason we have tears is because we judge what we see. Or, more importantly, we, we perceive it because we judge it. We perceive it fragmented because we judge. And then when we don't judge, the lesson assures us God's world is a happy world. God's world is there for you to see, and you can't see it while you judge it. So he's just telling us all along that there's no, no external world to your mind. So when your mind's in a pristine state of stillness and non-judgment, then you see a happy world. And you extend your joy into a joyful world and make it even more joyful. <laughs> you know, this just gets more and more and more joyful by the joy you extend to it. But, but judgment obscures the joy, the experience of the joy. So anything that we judge at all, as I said before, just judging a cup as a cup. Judgment is not necessarily condemnation, it's, it's categorization. It's giving false names and false labels to things that don't exist and trying to make them be something that they're not. Is a cup a cup? No, not really, because you can't really pull a cup out of the tapestry of the world. It doesn't, it wasn't meant to exist as a separate thing apart from everything else. Nothing was meant to exist in and of itself. There is no such thing as in and of itself. There is no cup in and of itself. There is no color blue in and of itself. I think there was Plato, one of the early Greek philosophers, who was pondering one day, and he was saying, if there were no red objects, would the color red exist? This is the kind of things that the Greeks would think about <laughs> when they were sitting in the, in the hot tub. <laughs> Next door the Romans were building spears and weapons and everything, and the Greeks were in the pools. <laughs> Imagine Plato, hmm, so we know red objects. Would red exist? You love it, you know? You, you, that's the kind, we need that. <laughs> we need some depth. <laughs> I was always drawn to the Greeks. I, so I've had a life of hot tubs myself, actually. <laughs> weren't, you, weren't you all pursuing being a CEO of some company? No, I, I was usually replacing a hot tub after so many years. Jenny knows that we had meetings. Oh, not just meetings, we sat for hours. Many meditation. hours. Yeah. yeah. We had the hot tub ministry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By bigger and bigger and bigger. What eight seater? Yeah, we have our morning meetings in eight seater hot tub. The hot tub was proportionally big compared to the house. The house itself was only eighteen hundred square feet, and you know, the hot tub was quite a few <laughs> square feet. But because we put the emphasis on going within, instead of trying to build something, grow something, make something, invent something. It was go inside, ask the deeper questions, and yeah, and that that thing. If there were no red objects, it, it's a color, but even the color seems to be a color apart from other colors, and that's part of the the fragmentation. That red is an invention of of the ego. So when Jesus said, "Judge not, lest you be judged." He wasn't saying just condemnation. He was saying more than don't condemn your brother and sister. He was saying your entire perception is made up of judgment, fragmentation. You you crack, crack your world up into many pieces, and then you go and try to name and label those pieces, and then you have names and labels for how those pieces interact. And we were talking yesterday about education and how it's becoming more and more specialized. 
medicine is more specialized. Auto mechanics is more specialized. Medicine, if you've been going to the dentist for the last 40 years, you know that there's been a lot of technology infused into dentistry. You can't, you know, used to go in and they'd scrub your teeth or something and <laughs> drill a hole and put some metal, <laughs> mercury or something down in the hole and everything, and now it's, it's dentistry is not the same. Nothing is the same because of the specialization. But Jesus is saying that the world of specifics was made by the ego and then it just keeps exploding and exploding with more complexity and more naming and more labeling. You know, with any field you look at, you can go in and if you were educated in the same field 30 or 40 years ago, then you wouldn't really know what was going on because you wouldn't know the lingo, you wouldn't know the language, you wouldn't be able to speak the language and identify all the specialization that had occurred over those 30 or 40 years. Without a lot of training and in-service workshops and up Upgrading, upgrading your education to keep up with the specialization. But spiritual growth and, and spiritual inquiry is in the other direction. You're interested more in the one than the many. Uh -huh. And you're interested in what is simple rather than what is complex. And really, you, you discover more that the present moment is as simple as it gets. It can't get any simpler than the present moment. So the mind that's just learned and overlearned and overlearned this complexity now is has to go through a phase of, of unlearning, unlearning, unlearning. And it seems like that could be dangerous to a mind that has learned so much, but, but once you realize that everything is under guidance, that whatever you seem to need, you will be told. You don't need to learn the specialties to hear the guidance. It's more that as you unlearn all the specifics, then you, you hear what you need to hear, you remember what you need to remember, and you sink more into a silence that's just natural and that doesn't need words to make it what it is or to define it in any way. And that movie we watched yesterday, it just it really stayed with me too, through the night and into the morning, because, you know, the lesson was so strong that, that it's not about changing what's on the screen. We saw the, the main character, you know, first he was quite clueless of what was happening, initially when he first opened his eyes in the train scene, but then he, with a, with a passion, with a, with a great effort, he went at trying to solve the mystery and solve the problem that was given him to solve. Like a good military officer, follow the commander's instruction, find the, the bomb and find the bomber. Slowly they had to introduce the military instruction and in one sense that's what humans are instructed to do there at some point. When you're a child, usually you get to play a lot, and that's seen as a good thing. But then it's time to get serious, it's time to become a serious adult, and it's time to learn what you want to do with your life, and go at it with determination and passion, and then you do that, only to find you don't find complete fulfillment and happiness in that direction, and then it's usually under, undoing, unlearning, letting go of everything that was pursued, because it's, it's not going to give the desired result. And even, even in that movie, I think our main character did, he did want to find the bomb, he did that, he wanted to find the bomber, and then after he found the bomber, there was more steps <laughs> he needed one more insertion to go in there and like feel he had handled it in a complete way. In such a complete way that he prevented the bombing entirely and turned the clock back uh, to the point where uh, 
Uh, good, good one. Open, woke up in the morning, checked her phone message when she got to work, and received an amazing message that was like a premonition of what was to come, and basically saying, and, and your source code works better than even you think, or even, than you even know. Mm -hmm. But it was really a message saying that consciousness is connected. There's, it's not. Uh, it was cute the way when they pushed the red button and and ended the life support for Captain Coulter. Uh, basically, it looked like a picture; everything froze, but then it did continue on, and that is 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 a good symbol too because. The world just seems to continue on as long as there's a mind that believes in it. And that sleeping mind does believe in it, and it, it doesn't really end with a photograph, but it does end with a, a watching, where you watch the world and you see everything that's part of that world is equally unreal. The only purpose of forgiveness is to see the false as false. There's nothing more complicated to forgiveness than just simply to see the false as false. Forgiveness doesn't really generate anything new, doesn't create anything, it just simply sees the false as false. And even in, in this amazing Buddhist movies where that, that's the most glorified state in uh, in the Buddhist tradition is simply to look upon the Maya and see it as Maya. Uh, see the false as false, you know, and be amazed at, at it. Just be amazed at, oh, it's all false. You know, that's, that's it. And Jesus is saying, well, that's the gateway then to what's true. The light behind the, the dream comes, can come into awareness when, when you cease to judge. So I, I, it just stayed with me too though, because it, it does bring your mind more to the place where you start to realize that you don't have this push and this sense of something inside forcing you to do something, forcing you, you should do this, you should do that. As I told Jenny at the time, you should never say should. <laughs> don't shit on yourself. <laughs> you know, you, it, it really is, it is kind of a forcing thing, that it's a forcing mechanism that's saying something should be different than it is. That's what should is. Something sh should be different than it is, and nothing need be different. Nothing can be different than it is, but it's, it's just eliminating that filter of, of ego that is unsatisfied, that is unsure, that is uncertain, that feels it's lacking in something, that's scarcity, it's a lens of scarcity that is going to push for something to change. Something needs to change, is what should is about. Something needs to change in the world, and that's not the case. Nothing ever needs to change. It's simply the way I look upon the world, my gaze on the world needs to be in alignment with truth, instead of Error. So do not see error is actually a call to a natural state of mind, a state of without judgment all things are equally acceptable. Oh, that's, that's very kind, that's very gentle. Without judgment all things are equally acceptable. That's why Jesus says, let all things be exactly as they are. That's why Paul McCartney recorded the Beatles song, one of the most famous of all the Beatles songs, Let It Be. Speaking words of wisdom, Let It Be. It was really that same presence coming through and just saying, gaze upon the world, let it be what it is. It doesn't go with our programming, which is always about bigger, better, faster, more. Our programming is about achievement, our programming is about overcoming something in the world, fighting the good fight. Uh, our programming assumes competition to be real, and then off to the races with trying to win the game. And 
the game, if it's a game of competition, it's a game of setup. It's it's a setup of the ego, a game that even when you win, you lose. <laughs> because there are no winners and losers in presence, in God's presence. It just simply is. And it's not something that you can have at the cost of someone else. It's not like someone can have God and someone cannot have God. It's like it's equally applicable to everything and everyone, because it's what God is, God's love. So it's like very, very soft loosening of the, of the pursuits. And then, yeah, Susan was talking about how all the steps, even for you coming to Europe, Iceland, Europe, at the most recent travels, mm -hmm. it's kind of clicked into place and coming here, clicked into place and you're just trusting that whatever's next will click. Every day I have a ticket to Barcelona. <laughs> <laughs> every day something clicks. Yeah. Yeah. And, and being able to just rejoice in, 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 as what's given, you know, as an obvious, oh there it is, okay, okay, that's good. And we don't need to know so far in advance, it's actually, it comes in as we just let go and then it just shows up and the top. There it is. Mm -hmm. I talked to somebody yesterday who I've never talked to. It was somebody had messaged me on WhatsApp, I don't know, some <clears throat> weeks ago or maybe a week, six or seven weeks ago or something from uh, Croatia. A woman uh, who used the name Chloe and she had messaged me and Oh, I'm loving all this, how can I be part of the movies? And I think I sent back, maybe six or seven weeks ago, I said, well, here's a movie link, I'm doing doing a movie, uh, and here's a link to it, if you want to just come and join, just join in on the Zoom room. And, and then um, she sent this yesterday, and I think in the morning, this long, long, glowing message about how this is, I, I spend my day, all day, watching your videos, using the resources, watching the movies. It's a woman in Croatia who's married, who has little children, and who basically, every waking hour she has during the day, she is just, oh I love the community, they're so open-hearted, and she's just over there using the internet, and just tapping into all the resources all day long. As her husband says goodbye to her in the morning and comes home at night. Is that guy still on the video? Yeah. <laughs> oh yes, all day long. And the community and the movies and the resources just doesn't miss a thing all day long. But she was just saying, just how happy she is, oh my God, this is showing me everything, and I'm so connected to Jesus now, and I'm so grateful, and on and on. And someday I would like to come to visit you in Mexico. I don't know how that's possible with these little ones that I have, but I trust that it will happen. So I wrote something back to her, and then <clears throat> it was the evening time, I, I had already put my phone to charge, but I went back to charge, put my watch to charge, and then the phone lit up and it was, it was her in the evening, nighttime, dark. Oh, I'm doing it, I'm coming, coming to Barcelona! <laughs> <laughs> oh, <baby. laughs> so she was like, I said, oh, oh, oh. So, in the morning, a, a video call, and then in the evening, another video call. In the evening she was, at, I think, at a restaurant with her family and she was, arms were flailing, and her blonde hair, and she was just <laughs> so animated and so excited. And then at one point she said, she went, oh here's my, my husband, my children. She went like that. <laughs> <laughs> we could hardly see, see anything, because it was so quick. You know? And then she's back. <laughs> so, you know, but it's just the vibrancy of, of that, like feeling a connection, feeling like it's nurturing, feeling like she's being spoon-fed through the, all the interactions. She, at the very end of the second call, she started singing a song that our 
friend Helena Hudson had done uh, from the early lessons of the workbook. That's not the reason why. <laughs> she started to go sing, that's not the reason why. The problem's not outside, you have to look inside. And, and so, so there she was somewhere in Croatia, <laughs> just planning to launch, you know, like, I'm do it was a big thing that night. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm coming. I just, and I don't know what will happen. I don't know what will happen with my husband, my children. I don't know, but I'm coming. You know, but it's this, this kind of feeling like, I'm going to God, I'm going to God, it's all I know. I'm going forward and I'm opening my heart and, and that's all I need to know. And I'm happy and joyful with just that, just knowing I'm opening my heart. I don't need to know the future. I don't need to know how things will look. It was like, what, that was the lesson of the movie last night, which was finally, you know, he just had to finally let go of the purpose of trying to, to solve something in the scenario and, and start to behold, you know, he ends up taking, I'll give you a hundred dollars, he says, comedian, if you can make everyone here laugh, and, no, 126, I'll give you 126 if you can make everyone laugh. <clears throat> And sure enough, the comedian steps right up, and then you can see the freeze frame of all the smiling faces and all the laughter when he's turned his purpose around from trying to solve the riddle of the, the scenario to just show up and let the love and joy of his heart beam through. And you could see it with uh, Christina too, you know, she she was quite delighted. She, she apparently was interacting with someone she knew as Sean, but she was like, Sean, you really changed. Like, <laughs> she, was, she was feeling the perception shift too, uh, that this wasn't the same person that she rode on the train with every day. But it's a shift in mind, it was a shift in consciousness, it was a shift generating from within, out of, first of all, out of his curiosity, what is this? What's going on? And what am I supposed to do? Then it started to shift at one point to who am I, using the internet to find out what was going on. You know, well, Captain Kohler, he, he's dead. Dead. You know, you can just see the look on his face. That was like a big whammy. The one that I'm looking for, the one that I think I am is dead. You know, <laughs> and, and, and getting the, that information coming in is like, okay, another step in the spiritual journey. The one that I believed I was is, is dead. So, I can't really stay identified with that one anymore because that one's gone for two months. <laughs> dead for two months, you know, not like dead two hours ago or yesterday. <laughs> dead for two months. Okay, something's going on here, then I have to find out what it is. That's the kind of inquiry, that's the kind of spark we need in our journey of discovery, to not just accept whatever our five senses are presenting to us as facts, but just as, as perceptions. And, and then start to say, maybe my five senses have not been reliable to me. Maybe they're part of the joke, or they're part of the trick. That's, that's a big step in the spiritual journey when you start to realize that the five senses are, are part of the deception, that you can't rely on them. Even though we've tried to stabilize them and we, we always are asking questions. Where were you? Why didn't you stop and get the milk like you said you would? You know, we always are questioning, 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 because we want our perception to be stable, we, we want it to be coherent, we want it to have continuity. And then the frustrating thing about the human condition is it, it isn't. It's, it isn't coherent, and it isn't consistent. It's very inconsistent, we have to start to say our five senses have been very inconsistent. And then we're constantly seeing more evidence that contradicts other evidence that we have, and then we start to wonder, what can I trust? And then people sometimes go into depression, and they think, there's some kind of a trick going on here, and I can't figure the trick out. And then it just seems depressing, like, oh my God, 
what what is this? How am I going to find my way? How am I going to make my way if everything is is so inconsistent? But that's what's so helpful about the teachings that Jesus is giving us is he's telling us from the beginning that your per perception is very unstable. Uh, it's it's not reliable. And that he does say at one point, only a constant purpose can stabilize events. So whatever events that you're perceiving in your perception, only a constant purpose in your mind will stabilize those events. So he doesn't just stop by saying it's unreliable. He's saying, oh, there is a way to stabilize it, and I'll tell you, it's a constant purpose. You need the Holy Spirit's purpose. You need to hold that like a torch out in front. You can't hold it like a torch or a flashlight behind you because you'll still trip and fall and stumble in the dark. You need that torch out in front. That's what the whole setting the goal section in the text is about. You need a, a constant, stable purpose out front. You can call it peace, you can call it truth, you can call it whatever you want to call it, but you have to let the purpose lead the way. And he, that's why he says there's one question you can safely ask in, with regard to anything, and that's what is it for? What is the purpose? Even with the phone in the workbook, you know, he says a phone is, is a device, a tool for reaching someone who's not in your proximity, but the real question should be what do you want to reach him for? He's asking, what do you want to use the phone for? Not the purpose for just speaking with somebody who's not in your proximity. Do you want to call them and yell at them? Do you want to call and blame them? Do you want to call to get something from them that you believe you need? A lot of calls are for getting something. You know, answer, even when the phone's dialed and it's ringing. Answer! Answer the phone! <laughs> Why? I need to get something from you. I expect something from you. You know, Jesus is like, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you want to reach him for? Are you calling to give a blessing? Are you calling to extend a miracle? Are you calling to extend love? Then you have a good reason to call. <laughs> but if you're not calling to extend love, you don't have a reason to call. He's put it in. <laughs> Go inside. Get in touch with your, your purpose. So that's, that starts to be extremely practical. Because it, it sets you in a direction where you start to feel like, wow, that's all my life is really for, is to give. I need to be like the flower that gives its fragrance. Moment by moment, day after day, week after week, year after year. It's just there to offer the fragrance and the beauty as a gift, but there's no reciprocity with it. The flower doesn't charge money for smelling the fragrance. The ch flower doesn't charge money for, oh, you think I'm beautiful? Three dollars, three euros. <laughs> you know, we would, it's ridiculous to think of a flower charging money, but actually it, it starts to show how ridiculous the, the human construct is when the, the body was simply meant to be used as a communication device and nothing more. And the ego uses it as a mechanism for getting. The ego is a belief in the mind, the ego wants to get things for its own pride, its own sense of existence, and then it uses the body as a getting device. And when it does, the body seems to break down, it seems to break down and grow old and get sick and die but only because it's being used for, as, by the getting mechanism in the mind. There is a giving mechanism in the mind, which is the Holy Spirit, and if the body is solely used by the Holy Spirit, then it's as serviceable as long as it's necessary, and then it is gently laid by. Like taking off a sweater or jacket. Service, 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 okay, and there. That's what death can be, is, is like a gentle laying aside of something that has served well. Thank you. 
we thank the body, Jesus says, for its service, and, and then you can lay it down. When our beloved Francis passed away, it was a little bit over a year ago, yeah, that was the quote that we put out about, about thanking the body for its service for a while, and then being grateful for it, and, and then laying, laying it aside. Because it has served its purpose. It has been used for what it was intended to be used for. So that is a very different purpose for your life. We don't come to this world with this strong, giving urge in us. Uh, it's pretty much covered over by the getting mechanism of the ego. The, the, the ego that draws us to this world in the first place. And it made the world to be a distracted device to seem to have lots of things that you can get. And then, it's like going to a, a fantasy world where there's always these things to get, and then you seem to be able to just decide, of all these things, which ones am I going to get today? And then the next day, which ones am I going to get? But it's, it's all for keeping the mind in, locked into the ego. So when the, when the mind is simply going to use the body as a communication device, then it's more ready to let go of the body and the world, in that sense, because it's more ready to come back to the pure state of giving, which is what God is. Pure giving, there's no getting involved in it. So too, we have one more movie night tonight, so we can look at, at even ask people, what kind of angle do you want to come at? This last night was a very metaphysical movie and involved kind of a military goal and consciousness and everything, but we, yeah, we have different movies with relationships, with sometimes with psychic abilities, with different uh, things that are part of the, the dreamscape that, that get used to go deeper. But we have to all hold that in prayer now, for this afternoon, to kind of feel a special request or prayers to have <laughs> things that still seem to be like, you know, oh, I need more, something more to be filled in around this area or, or that area. <clears throat> yeah, I thank you. Actually, Jack yesterday said, yeah, David told me once, he told me to speak as the Spirit, so after a wonderful day yesterday, I thought, ah, oh, I chill out the last day. That's <laughs> 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 not how it works. <clears throat> so, this, um, so the <clears throat> topic is to speak up and keep it pleasing. So, I guess it was 2022 when I first um, spoke up in an online meeting after the diagnosis from my wife. And, and um, things have been um, really, the last 10 years, very, very, um, very changing, but they didn't, didn't feel so light or not so much joy. But there is a lot of joy, especially yesterday I was probably one of the most joyful days I And I realized it has to do also with um, allowing myself to gently speak up because I try to to be strong people pleasing. I feel like it started in childhood already. Not speaking up and and the life issues is like there's no <clears throat> you know I have this strong feeling when I get touched just to be yeah it's okay well, well. and then I feel like shrink and and I was able to speak up and, <clears throat> and I did ten years of I went into coaching boxing so I I tried you know to to, to to like get a strong attitude and do, but this doesn't feel because I realize it's the mind. I, if I'm not honest, 
and you know, this vulnerability can just bleed and it won't go away. And I realized it was necessary to be able to do that, to gently say, yeah, I feel like that we just join in mind. And then I was also open to hardly joining as I was, was never possible. And it was, I just could, after one eye gazing over lunchtime, which was like the, 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 the trigger where I received so much, and I could just say, look, there's so much shame coming out, you said yesterday. Yeah. Being ashamed of feeling the joy, I hardly could hold it. But then I, <clears throat> and then I remembered, okay, after the eye gazing in the afternoon, how can you hold it? It's just by extending. And I could really see how there's one part of the mind that would try to, yeah, how to repeat that. Already, you could see how it would not work. So, but extending would work. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I feel extremely grateful for that. And uh, yeah, it, it was connected for me. I could see you as this speaking up and also all, all the issues are coming automatically. So I was driving in today and I was Jenny already waiting and then I said, can I park? And I was like, for what? And said, yeah, <laughs> someone will come to me. I could, I could also ask for a spirit, spirit, I said, where to park? And I said, yeah, maybe you could, but could be there. He said, no, that's not really good there. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I drive there and no, you have to drive backwards. <laughs> and, and thank you so much for that, really. We are really learning so. And it's not, it's, it was just realizing me then how it's about gently, it was not about saying no, it was okay for me to follow that. It was more about the, to admitting the feeling also later to say how I felt, which was, was difficult for me. So I thought, yeah, it didn't feel so good, but I followed. But that was it's difficult for me, not anymore so. And, I lay it on the now to, to gently say, listen, I feel differently, or could we just join in mind instead of touching? And yeah, so speaking up, not getting, getting into anger to, to steer you up to maybe speak out. Mm -hmm. and, to, to honestly speak up from the heart, which is much more difficult, but still straight saying what you feel. And uh, that's, I felt extremely connected to be able to, to receive and extend that love that I received yesterday, which, yeah, so. Yeah, that's beautiful. That, that is showing that this different way, doesn't it be challenging? But it does have to be different from the past patterns where there's so much hiding going on, maybe not even recognized. The people pleasing is is involved with a lot of hiding and and that's not necessary. So the opposite of the hiding would be the authenticity, the transparency. You know, we have to be taught and learn that transparency is valuable. And it's not, uh, we're not putting everything on anybody by being transparent. We're just getting in touch with our, our thoughts and then with our beliefs when we're transparent that way. And, but that takes a lot of allowance. It does take allowance because of the belief in rejection. Sometimes things are held in because it's like, uh, if I say something, there's a chance that there'll be a rejection or a a scolding or a sense of blame or wrongness or something. And we that's the way the ego has tricked us into repressing and denying so many things from awareness. And it doesn't help us heal when things are repressed and denied. So once we see that, then that suddenly becomes the purpose of relationships. It's okay to speak up, it's okay to to share what you're going through and feeling, because we learn to not take it personal. 
you know, we learn to say, oh, I didn't know that, thank you for sharing that. Oh, I didn't know that you felt that, you know, there's more of an allowance and an acceptance of that. It becomes more natural to, to speak up. And I think that's so important because then, then we can, we're more likely to hear that intuitive guidance when we feel a sense of openness in our mind. There's not a pressure, there's not a stress, we're not walking on eggshells afraid we'll say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. Yeah, it's very, very important. And it's very different from the way the world is. But we've set that up not only with relationships, but at work, you know, obviously there's things that people feel about their bosses that they don't speak up <laughs> because of the fear of getting fired, you know. And so various situations are set up also to keep this repression in place. I used to, to a series of jobs, I, I started to see it was more and more important for me to speak up and, and there was one job I had, I think when I was in university, I was in a co-op job and they would have to do, employers would do like a report on how you're doing and one of the things that that they said about me in that particular job was, David has a tendency to swallow his words, or to turn them down or mumble if I was afraid of what I was saying, <coughs> afraid of it being heard. David has a tendency to swallow his words, and so it was a slow process, little by little, different jobs, different opportunities, to feel more confident about speaking up and 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 get more in touch with my feelings that way, instead of being so repressed, being in such denial. Because denial of emotions and pushing things down is not helpful in spiritual awakening. Jesus would tell me that. He would say, no, no, you've got a lot of opening you have to do here before you're going to be authentic and before you can be transparent. It's because whatever you're pushing down, you believe is real and true and you're afraid of it. And you're afraid of admitting it, and you're afraid of seeing it. And, and ultimately, that's blocking you from releasing it. So, you know, it's kind of a system that we start to discover, like, oh my gosh, the ego has got this really tight, like, tightly wound, and we don't want to live like that anymore. So, hey, thank you for, all for, sh for sharing and opening up about this, because these are like huge insights. You're, you're like, what a joyful day that was yesterday. And, and then after you have it, then I want it to continue. And then the insight comes, oh, I need to, to extend it. I don't need to hide my light anymore. I have a light to shine, I have a light to share, and I, I want to do that. I want to let the Spirit direct it to, you know, what's the way. Because the Spirit can use all of our seeming skills, abilities, talents, you know, to, to let the light come through as a blessing, really, for the whole universe. So, thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you for speaking with me. <laughs> 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 I mean, so, I don't want to take too much time, but... I, so, I have two, two things. I feel I speak up. So, it's, it's so funny because after 10 years, so my wife, we had a much romantic relationship. I shared also you know, how difficult this was. We're still living together. And, but there's an opening just a few months where I said, yeah, I need to talk. I'm on a dating app in the category finding friends. But, mm -hmm. and so this is, was extremely insightful. And also there's, when I uh, hear sometimes, um, People connecting with you. I was in, after the, the sharing in 2022. There was a big lesson, which is for me. I feel so so good because I was thinking when I come here, wow, I see David. <laughs> but it it feels the same. It's really the mind, yeah. and it was a face. I know I, I don't use Facebook. I, I mean, there's a long time, but I, I haven't looked in over two years, but. And tribe changed, and some some people was connected there in the Unwinding Mindful Club. And 
I just didn't tell him. Then I was like, oh, that's David. I make a friend request to David. And then all of a sudden, there's I was like, ah, David has only 400 friends, but he traveled 75 years in the world. He, he <laughs> must be uh, still well choosing his friend. And then I realized, yeah, actually, it doesn't feel right. I didn't be Facebook friend. And then I was in a meeting with Calico. We made this really little groups, and, and then we had this really wonderful topic about letting go of the guru, because uh, she said that at one point, uh, Haim, you, you don't rely on on having some special relationship with, with the guru. So, so, and it is so relieving. I, I just listen there, and then you just oh, I need to get. You can get your mobile numbers, I can write you a WhatsApp or whatever. So it just feels, I just wanted to say that. So you are released as a guru. Pronunciation of Guru, Guru is G U R U. So, there you are. <laughs> you still are you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, we just want to cultivate a friendly, loving, caring relationship of, of equals. You know, that's what Jesus sometimes said, talks about himself as an elder brother because he's saying, I'm just like you. I, we share the same uh, creator, I'm just like you, and uh, he said, I do not retain the belief in time in my mind anymore, but other than that, we're, we're completely the same. <laughs> kind of inviting, <laughs> saying, yeah, and you, you shouldn't, or you need not retain time in your mind uh, anymore, then you see we're the same, same one. That's the only seeming difference, but that's something that can be released, so, yeah, that's beautiful. And sometimes I do that for fun, I'll be on Facebook and I'll, I did set up a profile, but I, I never go to it, but that's probably the one with 400 friends. The one that I use is 5,000, and it always, oh, there's so many friend requests and all kinds of different things. I can't, but I do, I do my own uh, social media, that's what, Suzanne was saying, she, you wrote to me on the Instagram, Instagram. and you answered me. In less than a minute, actually. In less than a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it was synchronized, it was okay. Ha! <laughs> 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 I've had some people who write to me on Facebook. I know this isn't really dating. <laughs> 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 Like a paragraph. Of, I know this isn't you, but I'm writing this anyway. And then I write, it's me. What can you do? <laughs> so we just like to keep it cordial and friendly, and yeah, that's that's what it is. We're all in this together. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you, Roland, for bringing up also this parking uh, situation. <laughs> it stirs up for me something like, yeah, I kind of suppressed it already this morning, but there was. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there was a kind of conflict, like I shouldn't um, uh, be people pleasing, and then I did not people pleasing, and then I was not so polite. So and now you're kind of dominant, and like this kill feeling. It's never good. And yeah, probably something to do with an identity. Like, wanted to be the nice guy. Yeah, it's a conflict. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, so I know. Just want to expose it and express it. And it's not fix my attention for the rest of the day or something. Yeah. And eventually the park and the, the car get back where it was when you put it at first. Yeah, so uh, I was not even needed this. Well, of course, it, now I see it's for forgiveness. But, yeah. And it's, um, yeah, it's a familiar feeling and that I am not so well. We're in the community, people pleasing. Um, so, yeah, it's, yeah, maybe it's another rule for my, in my mind. And that is not comfortable or familiar you know, yet. Yeah, our, our <coughs> May that make believe self concept has a number of aspects to it and roles to it sometimes. And they're all learned. They're all meant to be unlearned so we can forgive what we may to take the place of the truth. But but even the unlearning of the roles has to be just under the gentle guidance of the Holy Spirit. So we sometimes are given assignments or roles. Obviously in the movie last night, uh, Captain Coulter Stevens, yeah, he, he was given a role, a use, you know, find the bomb, find the bomber, and so forth. And, and he was a dutiful military serviceman, you know, of following the instructions with resistance sometimes. He had many questions and much resistance. And then as it went on, he was resistant. He, his mind would resist even going back to the scenario. They kept trying and trying and trying. It wasn't until they played the voice of his father, Donald, speaking, that he said, okay, send me back in voluntarily. He was resisting even going back in to the scenarios. So, if we see that those self-concept roles are part of the gentle unwinding and gentle undoing, and that the Spirit is using them to help us get in touch with what's underneath them. Because obviously we had to have some kind of guilt to take on these roles in the first place, and leave our Christ identity to take on these roles. But that's very much a part of what spiritual community is. It's just a lot of prayer and a lot of guidance. So sometimes people who have not been in certain roles are put into certain roles because it helps accelerate their undoing of those roles. Not for any kind of reason to gain more status or pride, but to undo them. And even with uh, the original two with the course, Bill and Helen, you know, Bill was the head of the department and he hired Helen to be a research psychologist on the on Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center staff in 1958, and so she was there, part of the staff, for like seven years before she started hearing those internal words, which is the Course in Miracles, please take notes, repeatedly, this is the Course in Miracles, please take notes, and then she was very frightened by it, because usually psychologists lock people up, <laughs> are hearing voices, so you can imagine the conflict. Like, she said, Bill, her, her boss, Bill, it's incessant, it won't go away, it just keeps saying the same thing, this is a course of miracles, please take notes, repeating itself over and over, and, and Bill was like, well, maybe you should, let's take it down, let's take it down, and if you write down what it's saying, and if it's gibberish, we'll read it, we'll throw it in the garbage can the next day, and we'll carry on. And so he was there working with her, but at some point, Jesus started to use Helen, and, and so she was channeling his, his voice, to address Bill, because at one point Jesus said to Bill, you're, you're a professor afraid of professing. What does that mean? 
he's a professor afraid of professing. Well, he's he's a professor in a higher, you know, Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in a university setting, and he's afraid of professing, so he's taken himself out of the classroom. He's not teaching anymore, he's just doing the administration. And then Jesus goes the next step and says, the reason you're a professor afraid of professing is because you believe that when you teach, you weaken yourself. So you see how Jesus not only starts to say, here's what's going on, this is why you don't teach anymore in the classroom, you just, if you're an administrator of other professors, you put yourself completely out of the teaching role, because you're afraid, because it weakens you, you feel. And that's a very common belief, that's why people are hesitant to to share some of these ideas. They're, they're, they feel they'll be weakened. Maybe other people will, will look down on them or, you know, have adverse reactions or they'll be weakened. Their self-concept will be weakened by teaching. Jesus is like, teach only love, for that is what you are. And the ego's like, you know, well, you maybe shrink down this much if you start teaching only love, you know. Because it's the fear of the reactions of people and being rejected and being turned away from and everything like this. So, so that was important for Bill to start to understand that he needed to be more confident slowly. And he really studied and practiced. He was one of the first two Course in Miracles students on the planet, but he really took to it to really practice, study it, practice it, and more and more get more faith and trust in turning to Jesus and turning over his fears and doubts. And then as it went on after the, the course was dictated and as it began to be published and everything, Bill kind of, he felt like it's, this is Jesus and Helen, Helen's show. I'm, I'm like a third wheel. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's not my show, it's like third, He's dictating it, she's taking it down, and I'm just holding her hand, and, you know. And it won't, so he felt kind of a sense of unworthiness, and he had a much smaller part, and he was just there to kind of keep her stable and calm during this very intense period of receiving the dictation and putting it down. But Judy Sketch told me that she she had an apartment in New York City, and, and then when she joined in on the, the group, she would always have, uh, you know, came from a Jewish tradition, like the Jewish mother, have everybody on the apartment in New York City for meals, and Ken would come, and Helen would come, and Bill would come, and she would cook, and so on and so forth. And at one point, they decided to go see a world-renowned psychic. So. Judy said, so they all went, she went, and Helen, Bill, Ken, they go to see the psychic, and the psychic goes into a trance, and then when the psychic goes into this trance, he points a finger at Bill, and says, you, you don't really feel worthy, you don't really see your part in all of this and everything, but the psychic said, you were her teacher for many lifetimes, pointed over to Helen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you taught her so much over all these lifetimes, and you, with the eyes closed, you, you had, had such a huge contribution, you prepared her mind to be able to be able to open up to receive mm -hmm. Jesus and everything like this. And, this. and Judy was there, and Judy just said, Bill just, <laughs> just burst into tears. Because he had judged himself as having, like an un he was unworthy, a much smaller role, like a third wheel. And that was one of those psychic kind of experiences where the spirit was coming through this psychic and just saying, no, no, you, don't, you, you have no idea the bigger context of things in the overall plan. And that's the way it is with these roles, you know, we, we tend to be pretty strongly identified with certain roles, or even roles that are given us. Yeah, I'm like the parking attendant guy. <laughs> okay, I can do a good job. That's the parking attendant guy, you know? And then we take on these roles, and, and the roles are only to be under Christ's control. You know, it's only to say, Jesus, 
comes through me and whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm interacting with, whatever role, that is for the undoing of the role, so that I can come to know myself as you are, as, as you really are, as I was created by God. So, over the years, you know, we've had many people, sometimes people will come in and they'll be kind of uncertain and, and feel maybe weak or unsure, and occasionally, it's, if, if they have a strong willingness to listen and follow, then Jesus will say they need to be put in a leadership role. Not to personally lead, but to be in a leadership role so that they can pray, listen and follow, so that Jesus can come through them and provide helpfulness to the whole situation. And thus, undo, eventually we undo all the leader-follower roles. Because those are just ego things that, they're just ego roles that have been made up. Usually the leader role is the superior role, and the follower role is the subordinate role. But we all know, in different situations with different people, we feel both of those tendencies. Sometimes we're with someone and we feel like, oh, I'm, I, I should follow, I, I definitely should not be leading here. We, we, we want to give away the leadership role in some situations. And then we tend to get resentful, not realizing we gave it away. We asked them in our mind to play that part. And then they play that part perfectly. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. I hate you. <laughs> How dare you tell me what to do, you see? It's our mind playing tricks with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, we take on the leader role, but, but that starts to be part where the, the follower starts to be resentful. And, and what Jesus is saying, yeah, we have to let the Spirit control the use of these roles to undo these roles. So it's never about maintaining the roles. It's always about undoing them. And like we saw in the movie last night, he really, he was in the role of a dutiful soldier in consciousness. He was trying to follow the command, commander's, you know, instructions, but he had many questions for, for them, for both of them, Rutledge and, and Goodwin. And then, in the end, it did carry him through to this place where he was able to follow what was in his heart, which was to be helpful. He wanted to save the people on the train and to save Christina. And he did finally, he was allowed to use that to go fully through to a point, I call it, it was a more of a quantum thing, where everybody was laughing and everything, the whole explosion in the train was prevented and it was just a helpful use. He was able to follow that helpful urge out all the way to the end. And, and then feel wonderful. Feel like he was in a brand new moment with Christina. They walked out into the sunshine in Chicago. And that, that shiny object, they were both looking at that. And what should we do today? Should we get that coffee? She was saying. I think we should just stay right here. You know, he was just so happy and content in that moment. I think we should just stay right there in the sunshine, just enjoy. So that's, that's the good news, that, that these roles that we seem to hold on to are just very temporary. And it's better to see the roles as learning devices, not as identity aspects. Because if we start to see them as identity aspects, then we feel guilt. Which is that was what you were feeling today. I had to be the bad guy. I was the parking supervisor, bad guy. Good cop, bad cop. <laughs> and, and this is more just like, no, no, that's just a temporary role that the Spirit is using to help me loosen from the roles. And, and then we pay more attention, just we're more intuitive, like, okay, what, what's the helpful use? And then we get kinder and gentler in those roles, you know. Like, it's a very light role that we're wearing, you know, we're making more, we make it more as a suggestion. I think it may be more helpful if you parked over there, instead of, move! <laughs> it, gets, it gets softer, <laughs> the less identified we are with the role, you know. It feels more like we give the suggestion. <laughs> but we're not like the stopo, you know, <laughs> kind of to enforce something. Yeah. Yeah, thank you.
Yeah. It's like everything in the world we can use for yeah. forgiveness. Yeah. yeah, everything can be used by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And we're just starting to just get out of the way and let it be used by the Spirit and feel the joy of that the light, lightheartedness. Yeah, there was, there was also a day Jenny gave me the toilet roll. <laughs> <laughs> That was, that was, uh, that was light. Rob told me he had never cleaned in his whole life. He said, where's the cleaning lady? <laughs> Just for the undoing. <laughs> there is so much undoing coming together in community and accepting the different roles. I thought it was interesting yesterday you said you were named king, after King David in the Bible. And, and so Matthew was our kind of our first community member. And it's, very, it's been very intense in the role because here I am in the leadership role, you know, in, a, in a follower role you know, in the community. And that has been a lot of um, intense strong emotions coming up and, and one day Matthew went into his higher mind and he came his higher mind gave him a poem and it's kind of very masterfully kind of written of being King David and that everyone should follow him. So it's been this kind of very intense like in the psyche, you know, this kind of fight at times. This, like, how do we undo that self concept? Yeah. I mean, spirit has us on this journey to undo the self, the small self. We can't do it alone. You know, we can't undo our own ego. But it can be, yeah. I mean, I had a lot of intensity when it was with you in the early days. <laughs> Three items up here. That's a very nice, gentle way of putting it. <laughs> I was leaving that open. <laughs> yeah, but... Cotton balls, daggers, <laughs> rocks. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really so much cried. I mean, the first first experience of that was very early on, and, and that was I had this kind of uh, feeling about male female, what you know, we should be so equal. And then I interpreted because David asked me, "Can you can you throw me my can you throw me my sweater?" He was downstairs. I was upstairs. I, <laughs> I was saying something. I thought, who does he think that he is? And why does he need a sweater anyway if he's enlightened? If he's enlightened. <laughs> I and he came towards me. I, I was, you know, when I started going downstairs, I got halfway down. David came up, came up, and he was just looking at me. You, I mean, fixated on the form ever since you got here, David said to me, and I started shaking. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, felt like, it felt like a psychic surgery. It felt like psychic <laughs> surgery. <laughs> like the Holy Spirit came in and just extracted that part of my ego that thought, mm -hmm. you know, this, that, that perceived inequality. And, and I was shaking, <laughs> and then there was this humble, helpful companion, friend, who was also in the house, Jeffrey, he came to me, I can explain to you, David is just, you know, helping you with this, and he was so gentle, because <laughs> <laughs> I was very... He was much. explaining it all. <laughs> yeah. 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 One time I know I threw a course book quite few in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> the item is revealed. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the last time. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of prayer because 
there's such, it's, you know, doing is intense to the ego. So we just have to, with a group of people, you have to keep praying and praying and praying what is most helpful in this situation, what is most helpful, because you're breaking old patterns, old thought patterns of pride and the past. It's like the past is just so strong and then you're slowly just breaking it up and so it can be dissolved away. But yeah, that's the thing. It takes a lot of faith and trust to hang in with it. You know, over the years, you just have to really keep remembering what is my goal, what is my goal, what is my goal, you know, and peace, the peace of God, you know, is, is the goal that's underneath everything. And then things play out because it's so much darkness that has to come up because the whole journey is through the darkness to the light. It's not about trying to sugarcoat things and just use a lot of positive affirmations and I always used to say it's like having like a, a cake of mud and you've got sweet creamy icing uh, on the cake of mud and it's, it's tempting to just stay and keep taking taste of the sweet icing rather than dig your finger down, but if you do dig your finger down, you know, it comes up dirty, it comes up muddy. It's the sweetness is covering over the unconscious darkness and we need that to be released in order to be fully free. So it's intense because when the darkness comes up, the ego will want to interpret everything in form as if something's going wrong, this is wrong, this is not right, this is evil, you know, it will make an attempt to judge, because that's why it made the form. It made the form to be the, the projection, the, the form of punishment, the, the form of darkness, you know, as if there are certain forms, certain shadows that are, are real. And the shadows all come from within us, from the unconscious mind. But it just takes a lot of practice to not buy in. That's why we've had this, no people pleasing, no private thoughts, guidelines, that's why we've had all those expression sessions over the years in community, in different communities and centers around the world, and even in places like China where there was a, I mean, the government and the way the society was set up, there was a lot of systematic generational repression that had gone on for many, many years and then when you go there and you say, okay, how are you feeling? It's almost like, you're asking me how I'm feeling and you really want to know, wow, it was rage. There was rage, terror, <coughs> darkness that had been systematically repressed for fear of, you know, harm coming or, you know, being, you know, like some of the countries still, I think it recently in the last maybe month I was seeing that there was a lot of hurricanes obviously in the United States, but floods in, here in Europe, there was floods in, uh, in North Korea and they were saying that a lot of people, leaders of different districts or whatever, were being killed because of the floods. So imagine being put in charge of a, of a area of land and then it flooding and then being punished by death for, for the flood. You know, that's the kind of fear when people have a lot of suppressed fear. It's a fear of consequences in the world. Very severe consequences coming and then it's easier in the mind, it seems, the ego will say, just push it out of awareness, just, just don't acknowledge it. And this is a course, course in miracles which is saying, you know, allow it up, keep allowing it up. And we tend to use a lot of, in community, a lot of projects and a lot of collaboration to kind of cultivate that, that spirit of joining and connectedness that, that needs to be there and also to encourage communication. Because when we come to this world, it's not like we're big fans of communication. We all have our own ways of trying to put limits on communication and and rein it in and, you know, sometimes speak only when we feel it's necessary. Some of us grew up in, in families that, where we were told, you know, children should be seen and not heard. <laughs> That's quite a 
a thing to grow up with in a family. You're supposed to be seen but not heard. In other words, don't speak. But that's very unnatural for children to just try to swallow everything and, and hold everything in. So it's, it's definitely a lot of undoing that has to occur. And, but now we have a context for it, you know, that's what's helpful about the Course. Can you see my speech? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of what you've been saying has resonated. So, when I've been listening to you, I've, at times I just get very manic in my mind, very intense. And then I go the opposite, I start to get sleepy. Um, and then I think after all of that, I then get really panicky and, and I can't speak. That feels so unworthy. Mm. And there's been a lot of people spoken about that the last couple of days. And then when you spoke about um, the, the professor, I forgot his name. About leading, not professing. Can I just ask you, Jenny, were you, did you look at me or was it somebody else earlier? Look, no. Yeah, it felt like we looked at each other for a bit. Yeah, yeah. Did you? Uh, just, it was just at that moment that you were speaking about all that. I'm not leading. Um, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I think it's just, I can go on and on and I know I go on and on, but I don't know what to say. Just feel distressed. And I don't know how to... I had to thought at one point, when, I, when all that sort of manicness was coming, that I just felt unworthy. And somewhere in all of it, I just get lost. And I remember coming to your retreats and sharing something about this once, and Kirsten was there as well. And, but quite often I, I would get into a cycle where I put off sharing, and then I didn't share, and then I was really frustrated with myself. Yet again, I hadn't shared. Um, it feels like um, I've been losing my memory for over a year now. And I, I couldn't say it was because I was getting more into the moment, even though that's something I want to do, love to do. I feel it's more interference of fear. Um, I'm struggling to remember things here, yeah, even. <sighs> I don't really want to be here. Everybody looking. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I, just, I could stop. Or I could offer a bit more information. Doing projects in the outside world, just for me, just like advertising car to sell, or buying a phone, or speaking to a tax man. All those get can get really fearful and I have a lot of aversion. Eventually, when I do do it, it usually... I realize, oh, that wasn't so bad. But I still have the same... It doesn't get easier. I don't find it get easier than it. Maybe just recently. I was so fearful, I just meditated on that for a long time, around advertising this car, and I felt a lot calmer. And I felt more inspired. And I was supported by Dirk as well. So these are sort of areas that where this gets disproportionately crazy, really. Yeah, it's, it's intense. The human mask is very intense. 
And it helps when we start to see that there's underneath, way, way, way down in our mind, underneath, way underneath the mask and all of the beliefs. It's just, it's, it's just an authority problem. And the authority problem is, who is my author? It's a question. We got a, the princess and the pea, you know, the princess is underneath 20, 23 mattresses and feels the pea. <laughs> That's un at the bottom. Even through 23 mattresses, something's not right. Something's not comfortable. But it's helpful to, to start to remember, okay, that's, that's what's underneath all upset is, who is my author? It's really the question, who is my author? And, and the answer is always, God is my author. And, and yet, when we believe in the ego, then it's the belief that we can author ourselves instead of being authored by God. We, we are the author of ourself. And that's always shaky ground. That's always got some intensity and confusion with it because it's not true. <laughs> it's like it's it's a lie and we're we're trying to live with a lie. And and so in the end we have to give up the lie. And, and that takes a lot of soul searching, you know, a lot of, of inquiry, a lot of depth to go, a lot of surrender too. I am as you created me. What would you have me do? What would you have me say? Where would you have me go? You know, to be in that beautiful connection of just show me the way. I need help. Show me the way. Show me the way every day. And it can be around certain events like selling something, talking to the tax man, different interactions that we have. But, but the anxiety that we feel or the intensity or the stress around various things in the world, it's, it's beautiful that you were able to just meditate on it and kind of go deeper with it and say, wait a minute, this seems irrational to have this much intensity. And in the end, it's, we're just praying to be done through. We're just praying that the Spirit is the one that moves the puppet. You know, just move the puppet for your purposes. Don't, I don't want to try to be like the old uh, cartoon or character Pinocchio. You know, Pinocchio is, starts off as a marionette. And, and Geppetto, the puppet maker, has made Pinocchio, and it's just a marionette, and then he has this thing in his mind, he wants to be a real boy in the, in the parable, and then he wants to be off the strings, and and as soon as he's off the strings, then he does have a, a voice guiding him, a conscious voice, which is a Jiminy Cricket, but he doesn't want to always follow the Jiminy Cricket, and he doesn't pay attention to the helpful guide voice that he's given, and then he finds himself off in Pleasure Island, a big distraction, and where little boys get turned into half, this half boy and half donkey. It turns into a, it goes bizarre. It goes really bizarre. But it starts with the, the, will, the desire to be off the strings, to be an autonomous real boy. And that that's a nice, a nice little little fairy tale that is reminding us again of the of this desire to create ourselves, to be our own creations, to be to not have to be on the strings and to be following something. In the case of of the course, Jesus is saying, I just follow heard one voice. He just had a prayer in his heart just to hear one voice instead of the ego and the Holy Spirit, just to let one voice direct the guide with every circumstance, every action, it was surrendered over to that. Which is really just a way of saying, if I want to hear one voice, I want to know myself as you created me. I want to, I want to be real. I want to be my real, true, authentic, loving self that you created me as. And so, it, it's kind of a working backwards, like uh, in the East, Eastern philosophy, they talk about neti neti, not this, not, not that, not this. 
we start to approach truth by realizing everything that truth isn't. That we filled our mind with a lot of untruth. Uh, and and when we we want to learn how to forgive, so we can say, I believe, help my unbelief. My unbelief is is where I haven't fully given my my beliefs over to the spirit, you know, where I'm still trying to hold on to beliefs in an autonomous way that don't line up with love. And so we, we build our faith, we build our faith. I, I say it's like we have a conscious mind and an unconscious mind, but as we keep allowing the darkness to rise up and we keep handing it over to the light, then in one sense forgiveness is being fully conscious, like fully conscious of our decisions. Like we're not letting any unconscious beliefs dictate our actions, pull the strings of our puppet. We're just becoming fully conscious. And and to be fully conscious would be also to, to do it for the blessing of the whole universe. We, as human beings, we weren't trained on what's good for the whole. We were trained on what's good for me. And people would tell us, you really have to look out for number one. I was told that for many years, look out for number one. Look out for number one, and I'd say, who is number one? Say, David. <laughs> and so, you know, it was like, that was like being fed this thing. And there was a football player, a very good uh, running back for the Chicago Bears, Gail Sayers, and uh, he had a he had a friend, Brian Piccolo, and, and they, this book was written, and, and the name of the book was, I Am Third. Um, God is first, my family is second, and I am third. And in one sense, we're being asked to put God first, and go through a healing by putting God first. And putting God first means be intuitive, be listening, be following, be lined up with our, our true source, with our higher self, and come more and more and more into alignment with that higher self, and feel more natural, free, joyful, happy, peaceful, in alignment with our higher self. So it's, it is kind of that, that's the, the conundrum, you're, you're expressing this, Peter, where it's this thing about it's, it's what Roland was talking about too, it's where we we feel some kind of inhibitor or some kind of thing that feels like it's holding us back from from speaking up. But then it just kind of builds up. The inhibitor builds up, builds up, builds up. And sometimes in psychology they call it passive aggressive, where sometimes we are very passive and then at one point something flips over and we feel aggressive. And we can feel very manic, you know, very uh, energized, very out of control when that comes. And yet, the inferior, superior thing that goes on in our mind, or the, the repression and expression thing that goes on in our mind, these are all just ego defense mechanisms to prevent us from, from coming more in alignment with what is real and true. And it's, it feels like an unsolvable situation. That's where the, I think the intensity comes in. It feels like it. We're, we're given some kind of unsolvable equation. Like a Rubik's Cube that has no answer to it. That we're just kind of flipping around like this a lot, trying to find the solution. But eventually we do come around to the point where we start to tune in and we do pray, like you were saying, we meditated when it's, we start to feel the anxiety and it feels better. It feels like it's quieting, we're quieting the mind down. And we get more willing to voluntarily just be used by spirit, you know, in a greater plan that blesses the whole, you know, that's, instead of thinking about what's in it for me, which is our old conditioning, what's in it for me, what's in it for me, in the end, that question is not really helpful. Because the me is 
that we believe ourselves to be is not the, the real the real me. So it's beautiful that you first you got up and give yourself to move around a little bit. It feels a little bit better then, okay? And then you knew that you were to speak. And that that or you you were looking at me. <laughs> 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 Quite a bit. So <laughs> Looked like you were ready to come in. I was. <laughs> I took that as a prompt. Yeah, yeah, that's good. There's still, I mean, so it's quite hard to hear about me, that, that place you're saying. But what about me? I, I can feel a lot of <coughs> charge about that attack within mm -hmm. myself. So I, I'm I just left with I, I feel confused because I don't know as you said I don't I don't know what to do anymore I have no idea I don't know how to open the door. Um, and there are times when the door feels I'm connected, I don't feel that never happens. But it does feel like I'm right up like here now. I don't know where to go or what to do. And all that you said, I could feel like that was true or could be true. I just I don't know what to do with it. I just can't, in, yeah, just to even describe, can't imagine letting go, maybe, or whatever that is. Yeah. You know, it seems to be this, there has to be just lots and lots and lots of, of gentle steps, what seem to be smaller steps that start to build some confidence in, in the direction. And, and so Jesus is just trying to be so soft with us. He's just saying, well, or just be willing to come in the direction of truth or the light. Not even knowing exactly how that will look or how it will play out, but just the feeling in your heart, like, okay, I know there's softer times or quieter times, and, and that's what I want. I want to move in, in that yeah. direction. And just the willingness to to move in that direction is, is where it starts. Okay, that feels really helpful. Yeah. Suddenly I don't feel I'm right up against the door. Yeah. Suddenly, in a way, being told what's wrong with me, but without a way out. And mm -hmm. now I felt that, and I heard you speak that very directly, similar to somebody else yesterday, and possibly several other people. And I could, yeah, thank you, that, that feels, yeah. that feels possible. Uh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he to me. Thanks. Forgot your name. Sorry. <laughs> 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 I'd be happy when I forget that name. <laughs> 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 oh, whatever it is. <laughs> We are the nameless one. <laughs> uh, so it, I have this quote from the play from Apple Smear that keeps coming to my mind. Uh, it says, when you, when you laugh at someone, it's because you have judged him as a unwolf. And in which sense it says uh, when you laugh at someone? I, I don't understand that. Too. Yeah, it's talking more in that context of more of a like a put down laugh. Like I used, to, I mean, I love watching comedians, and I watched a lot of comedians and lots of over the years. But but some of the comedians, when I would watch the content of their jokes, they were put down jokes. And everybody was laughing. They would be they would be putting someone down. Everyone laughed. The next joke, put somebody down, laugh, and their whole routine was was put downs. And that's what that reference is from the course. You know, it's 
it's it's this uh, this insecurity about work and this this feeling that that by putting somebody else down or laughing at somebody, uh, it eases the, the tension or the guilt in some way. But it's that's not the gentle laughter of the Holy Spirit. It's it's a it's the laughter of the ego. It's it's really uh, it's a laughter based on superior inferior. And in the end. You know, I used to watch those comedians, but in the end, it wasn't funny anymore. I, w I would watch the comedian, and I would just be like, hmm, that's not, it didn't, there was nothing laughing inside me, I was putting down somebody. On the other hand, you can start to feel like, like, uh, like there is this gentle laughter where you find yourself laughing sometimes for no reason. You just are bursting in laughter, like it's coming up from inside you and you're just laughing. And you don't even need comedy shows or comedians for it. You know, it's just like you're just laughing at the, at, oh my gosh, I took this, how could I have taken this seriously? You know, I can't believe I fell for this. But it's in a light, gentle way, like you're, like, it's a freeing laughter. Like Jesus saying, the world will end in laughter. That's the kind of laughter that I would say is inspired by the Spirit. And it's a very gentle laughter. And so, yeah, the, the part though that you're referring to is, like, it's, it's a sense of feeling unworthy and then perceiving it and laughing at somebody else. Ah, look at them, you know. and. There's a saying, you know, but for the grace of God, there go I, but, but I always got the sense that Jesus was saying, yeah, because of the grace of God, you have to say, there go I. I mean, everything and everyone is, is a reflection of mine. So the only way to feel the connection and the softness is to start to realize that everyone, we're all connected, and that nobody's ahead, nobody's behind. And there's nothing, there's no joy in putting anybody down, and, and there's no cause for laughter in, in putting a brother or a sister down. Because it's just reinforcing inequality, and, and separateness, and differences, and that's not, it's not funny. You know, it's, it's something we want to let go of. Yes. I feel called to share. Um, it's, it's been a very healing weekend, um, and I want to reference Roman here for asking the question about speaking up because that's what inspired me to speak up. Um, and the healing has been around the two areas that I have struggled with. Um, and yesterday, when I came in, my prayer for the morning was, you know. There's a lot of effort in this journey. It feels very strenuous sometimes. Um, so through the eye gazing yesterday, that was released with no effort. Uh, so that was yesterday's session. And then this morning, Roland pretty much asked me the question I had about you know speaking up. And the question I really wanted to ask was about guidance. And just verbalizing the question, the challenges I have with guidance started to release because I wanted to ask about how do you differentiate between the voice of the ego and the voice of the you know Holy Spirit guidance. And as I sat here, you know, the blocks that I hold within started to come up. Um, it's to do with you know, I'm worried about the kind of guidance I will um, receive and maybe guidance I don't want to follow. Um, and I think just the sense of heaviness that this journey is about sacrifice, which I know we touched on yesterday, there's really no sacrifice other than the belief that there is sacrifice, but there isn't any sacrifice that's being called on. So yes, there's been a lot of healing, but if there's anything you can add on the subject of guidance, um, how to be really clear, because when you share your experiences, it sounds like you have very direct interaction with Jesus day to day. 
and in terms of how direct your guidance feels, for me, I find this second guessing. Um, even when, in hindsight, it's very clear that was a direction that was being given, the second guessing, and part of it is to do with some expectation that it perhaps needs to be difficult. Um, and a very good example, because I've been in Europe the last four weeks, um, you know, using a company phone at that point, I wanted to, I was beginning to worry my data will run out. And as I was waiting in Malaga at the airport, I just got inspired to go by roaming Wi-Fi. And my Wi-Fi has been so easy. You know, I'm in a country I don't speak the language. And that felt like guidance um, in, in a very practical way. So some of it is to do with expectations, I guess, that it needs to be had. So therefore, there's resistance to hearing it because of those expectations from past conditioning. So anything you expect to speak on that subject would be helpful. Mm -hmm. I think guidance is one of those experiences that it seems to get clearer and it seems to get more direct the more we trust. And the whole journey, the seeming journey of, of the spiritual awakening is one of building trust, expanding faith and, and trust. And I think what you're describing is, is common for many people that, that they they have some good experiences with, with guidance, but they sometimes had some negative experiences and then that turns into like a, a critique, like a, a suspicion or a doubt. And second guessing, uh, which, which is not building confidence, the second guessing is more expanding the, the, the doubt. And I think for me, it, it is very much stepping out of our comfort zones which is stepping out of our past associations and our identity has been so tied into those past associations that every time we do have a strong guidance that comes and we follow it, then we seem to be loosened up more from the past and more clear and more clear channel and a clear conduit. Because as a human being, we have expectations of how there are certain things we would like to have to happen in our life and certain ways we would like it to go. I, I know Frances, who I traveled to many countries with, you know, she would always tell me I, that she said she had goals of traveling the world, of seeing many places, meeting many people. Uh, she had goals for her life, but they were all more towards the end of her life. She figured she'd have to work very hard and be very successful and have a lot of resources at her reckoning at her, at her hand to be able to live the kind of life she wanted in the future. And she found that it got reversed that that all the things that she wanted to do eventually in her life she found herself doing, you know, at a much younger age, uh, traveling the world and meeting people and connecting and opening it up, but the more we talked about it, you know, she was, she just was so open to trusting and letting her faith expand so rapidly that she would oftentimes, you know, call to me or write to me and just say, I'm feeling guidance to do this, you know, I'm feeling guidance to leave my business. I'm feeling guidance to divorce my husband. I'm feeling guidance to sell the, a, a couple houses that I have. I, you know, I'm feeling guidance to travel, to to come to this retreat week long immersion, or to that one. Oh, I'm feeling guidance to come to the next one, the next one. At one point. You know, it was it was all part of a rapidly expanding faith and trust and more certainty in the guidance. But at one point, we were down, I think, in Australia in a place called Kangaroo Valley, and she was talking with me. She had so much wanted to do a one-on-one. -on -one. We were doing a one-on-one, -on -one and she was talking to me, and 
while the voice of David was talking, uh, she was hearing this inner voice speak to her, and, and the voice was saying, David is my representative, you know, follow him. Uh, well, I was talking about, I don't know what topic or whatever, she was hearing that internally. So, there was a lot of, it seems to be directly tied into trust. I remember one time when uh, Jason Warwick and I were, went to her house, and we were just visiting, and, and she welcomed us in, and then she said, oh, I think I need to go uh, get some groceries, and then she said to Jason, um, why don't you come with me? And Jason said, okay, so they went to the grocery store, they were in the aisles buying the groceries, and then she walked up to to uh, Jason, and she said, okay, give it to me straight. And he said, what? He said, she's like, what's it going to take? What's what going to take? To hear the guidance, to give my life over, to follow this path completely, you know, what's, what's it going to take? And she basically heard, uh, Jason just said, trust. And then she said, trust who? <laughs> and Jason said, Trust David and trust me. And she said, okay. And then she just rapidly seemed to take a lot of steps that were seen as pretty radical by the world. But when she was later on asked about these seemingly radical steps that she took, she said they didn't feel radical to her. They just felt given. It just felt like, oh, of course, this is the next, of course, of course. So it wasn't, it wasn't like there was a lot of doubts or second guessing going on. And I think that that's the way that guidance works, that, that we are to learn how to pray and how to listen to these internal nudges, little internal prompts, little internal suggestions uh, that were given. and. And to the extent that we can really like, feel the goodness of them, the naturalness, the, uh, the obviousness, how obvious and evident that they are, which she, would, she was doing, she would like feel it, and then she would just say, yes, of course. And, and it seemed to be a letting go of a sense of a personal will and a personal identity and more into merging with what's real and true, uh, and feeling the joy of that each time. It, it just got more and more stronger and stronger and stronger. I remember one time, because uh, Francis's mother lived in Beijing, and we were going over, maybe it was like the, maybe the third or fourth time we went I think we went to China like seven times, but maybe the third or fourth time. And we landed in Beijing, and her mother called her up and said, uh, Yeah, I, I'd like to have uh, lunch, with, lunch or dinner with you. And Francis just said, Well, let me just pray on that and check. And then she called her mother back and said, Oh, every day is, is booked up. Uh, for, I don't know, for the next couple of weeks. She said, it's just so full and so bulked up. And her mother was like, you have to be kidding me. You, you travel all over the world, you finally make it to Beijing, and I'm your mother. I wanted to have lunch for dinner with you. And she's, no, no, at this point there's no openings. <laughs> you know. Because it, it, it's just like, what's the, the service and devotion to what's most helpful? We were going around doing interviews, going to groups, going to even hidden Course in Miracles groups that weren't allowed, didn't feel it could be public. We were going to secret Course in Miracles groups and meeting with so many people. And for her, it was, that was just a, a good example of how surrendered over she was. And I think at the very end of that trip, uh, there was a little time, maybe an hour and a half or a couple hours, that opened up and she called her up. She says, okay, uh, I, can, I can have lunch with you. So, 
her mother was, oh, great. So when the mother finally got to have lunch with her, she, she had asked Francis a lot of questions, like, what's going on with your life, and what, what are you doing with your life, and what's it all up to, and everything. And Francis said, well, I'm very busy. I don't really have time, but David has a website. It's all been put into Mandarin. All, all your questions are answered on the website, so just read the website. She just gave her a request. <laughs> So her mother read the website, and she in Mandarin, and been translated to Mandarin. And so when they came together for lunch, uh, her mother was like, "Oh, I did read the website. So basically, this world is an illusion." She said to Francis, "That's what I'm getting from reading the website. This world is just an illusion." Francis said, "Yes, that's very good. That's exactly what it's saying." And then her mother said, so, so what is our relationship if we're not uh, mother and daughter? Uh, what is our relationship? And Francis said, well, we have to look at the relationship being the dreamer of the dream to the dream. And her mother was like, wow, that's deep and just took it into prayer, took it into prayer. And so the lunch that they did finally have was, was very deep interaction with lots of prayer and lots of, of stillness. And then toward the end of the lunch, then the mother just, she just was very quiet and she said, well, I guess then the only question there is, is who am I? Francis said, yeah, exactly. That is, the, that is the question. And then she subsequently found out that after that lunch meeting, her mother, who was an atheist, uh, basically went into a full-blown uh, mystical experience after that encounter. And it was so huge and so mind-expanding uh, that the next communication Francis had from her was uh, her mother trying to explain the, the mystical experience in words, and then basically Francis said, oh, what is your question? Do you have a question? And then the mother said, how can I tell my friends about this mystical experience? And Francis's answer was, it was only for you. It was only for you. you. You don't have to figure that one out. You can't, you can't really explain it to anybody. It was only for you. It was just from your heart. It was just an answer, an experience, as an answer to your prayer in your heart. So it, it kind of just goes to illustrate, you know, it's, it's really about hearing guidance. It's really about your yes to God. Of course it would have to be because it's only interf the interference only comes from self doubt. It still comes from that question that her mother raised. You know, the only question is who am I, and and that is where the second guessing or the doubt comes in. But the more we just come into that feeling of saying yes, saying yes, show me. You know, thy will be done, thy will be done, show me, show me, you lead the way into that place of receptivity, then it's like all of the answers have already been given us in our heart and we're just able to access them. We're given access to them because we don't have resistance, because we want to hear them. And there's even some good movies that have been made on that, and this movie with Robin Williams called What Dreams May Come, where he he seems to die in a, in a, in a tunnel, a highway tunnel, where he's hit by a vehicle, but then he has a spiritual guide that shows up and everything's kind of blurry, and at some point when he keeps asking this guide, you know, I want to see 
my children, I want to see my children, and the guide says, you'll see them when, you, when you're ready to see them, when you want to see them, and that's pretty much how the movie unfolds, that he's able to finally meet his children who are there to reflect his mind when he's, when he's ready to see them. And it seems to be, that is the way with guidance too, you know, when we're, when we're ready, the guidance is already there. It's, we're, we're very ready to hear it, you know. So it's not so much of whether we can or can't hear, or the interference is, but how, how much do we desire to hear it? How determines how ready we are to hear the obvious. And for Francis, I used to say, well, if they make an encyclopedia on spiritual awakening, they'll just have to put a, a little photo of you and your name next to, next to spiritual awakening in the encyclopedia. But what I was really saying to him was, it was just such a strong willingness to pray and listen and follow, that the, the way opened very rapidly for her, and the answers came very self-evidently for her, you know. Other people would say, that's a big deal, divorcing your husband, or that's a big deal, letting go of your business, or that's a big deal, leaving your country, and she just followed so rapidly the, the, the guidance. She would just join with me, we would pray, but she just was so willing to listen and follow. I think there was one point where she was traveling all over the world, but she would go back, she'd grown up in Beijing and in China, then she became a resident of Australia, had an Australian passport, then she came over to the United States, and we traveled all over the world. And at one point, her mother just contacted her and said, I just want to be with you, I just want to be, see you more, I want to just live in the same place uh, as you. And so her mother said, I, I've got this idea that I'm going to apply for uh, an Australian residency, a visa residency, so I can be closer to you. And Francis kind of laughed and said, well, if that's something you feel strongly about, she said, I don't even know if I'm going to be in Australia. It's wherever the Spirit's going to use me or take me. I can't guarantee. And her mother said, well, I think it's, you know, it's a lot of money or to spend like, I don't know, what it was something like 20, $25,000 on this visa and everything, you know, should I do it or not? And Francis said, you have to go and consult your guidance for that. But don't do it because you think that I'm going to be living there. You have to feel it for yourself, because I don't know where Spirit will have me. Spirit has me all over the globe, all over the planet. And in the end, her mother just felt like, I think I need to do this, and did apply and got the Australian visa, but, but Francis really wasn't back much there. It didn't seem to do the thing that, that her mother wanted this to do. She just wanted to live closer. But she also un, unwound so rapidly from the self-concept of, of this world that, um, that and she started to take these steps and really unwinding it, letting go of all the concepts that she'd identified with in the world. Uh, her ex-husband was quite concerned about her, and her mother was concerned, like, what is my daughter doing with her life? And Francis was going so rapidly into pray, listen, and follow, she was just releasing the past past concepts, she was emptying her mind so fast from these concepts that at one point her mother said, well, I would like to, to uh, visit you. Where will you be? I mean, could you make it to the West Coast and I can fly out to uh, California, I can fly across to California and meet you in a hotel and we could spend some days together. Francis said, oh yeah, I do have time to do that. So, so she flew out to a hotel and her mother was there, and they were going to spend a few days with her mother in this hotel. And already twice before, uh, 
her mother and her ex-husband had tried to to get her back from her journey and they it turned into the story of the three priests they sent in a, a priest to try to tell her that she had lost her way and she wasn't following God and she wasn't following Jesus and then they had sent a second priest uh, to convince her that she had lost her way and she wasn't following Jesus and everything. And on this particular occasion, her mother and her ex-husband had got the third priest. And when she was in the shower, thinking she was, her mother was visiting her, she came out of the shower with a towel on and there was a man there. And it was another priest there to convince her that she had lost her way. This priest had studied the Course in Miracles for many years and found it to be diabolical and had become a priest, Course in Miracles specialized deprogrammer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so she came out of the shower in a towel and was like, who's this? And said, and her ex-husband was there and this Course in Miracles deprogrammer priest specialized for deprogramming when the Course in Miracles was there and everything. So, so the first two priests, it, it was kind of a shock to her system, but, but she became very confident after the first two priests. <laughs> so this was, even though it was a specialized one to deprogrammers, you know, she ended up talking with him and talking with him and, and she went back and she got dressed and finally you know, he wanted to talk on and on about it. And she said, well, her, she knew her mother and her ex-husband had wanted to go to dinner. So she said to them and to the priest, well, why don't we all go to dinner? I'll go to dinner if, if we can talk about another topic other than me going, going my, my wrong way. And so they finally agreed. And at one point, though, when she said this, the program a priest was talking to her, she just couldn't hold it anymore. She just burst into laughter. And she absolutely could stop, not stop laughing. She just was uncontrollable laughter, laughter. And that, the priest got very quiet. And she just burst for like five minutes into laughter. And then she, then she said, why don't you come with me and we'll all go have dinner. And, and then they, the the priest was able to talk a little bit about his journey and they all were able to kind of get on to another topic that felt helpful for all three of them, where they could find joy in common ground and everything. And I remember I was, I was with Judy Sketch, the, the publisher of the course, one of the original four with the course. We were having lunch and I, I said, Francis, why don't you tell her the story of the three priests? And Francis told Judy Sketch, and Judy went, oh, that's good. <laughs> that is so good. That reminds me of stuff I'm going through. You should make a book out of that, maybe even a movie. <laughs> All of the three priests. <laughs> but it, it seems, again, in answer to your question, that, that by listening and following, then it kind of opens the way, it lights us up, it lights our mind up. And every time we pray and we listen and we follow is a confidence builder. It's like the miracle convinces us more and more surely. We get more and more certainty every single time that this is the way. And then that sense of second guessing and the doubt starts to fade away because it just gets to be like overwhelming. The, we're overwhelmingly convinced. I had a student years ago, probably, I think maybe in the, the late, maybe in the late 90s, and, and her name was Mary, and at one point she just turned to me and she said, what if it's a hoax? She said, what if A Course in Miracles is just a complete hoax? And I remember looking at her and I said, you really had that thought? She said, yes, I do have that thought, I'm asking you. And she said, have you ever had that thought? And I said, no. I, 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 there was such a strong recognition from the very beginning 
that, that it's just been a strengthening of the faith and an expanding of the trust and the faith. And, and she said, you really never had the thought that it's just a hoax? I said, no, I haven't. I'm listening, I haven't. And, and so I think it's just that builds and builds and builds as we have more and more expanding experiences and, and then it seems to get stronger and stronger and easier and easier. It seems to get more, uh, it seems to be more natural, more just automatic and, and nothing that seems to be, not something to work at. But, but the successes, I would say, the miracles, we become more more consistently miracle-minded, I guess is the way to say it, then then that seems to strengthen us for when we seem to have something that the ego says is more like a crisis or a big, big decision, big turning point decision. We're kind of on the, on the flow of the habit, of being a habit, then it just seems to come in very naturally. That's what it was for Francis. But she was just uh, so, so willing, and the things for some people that are big deals were not big deals for her. She just said, huh, it was, it was obvious. And people say, surely it must have been a tough choice with divorce or leaving your business or selling houses or those kind of things seem like big ticket items, you know, to the ego. And she was like, oh no, no I, don't, I don't consider those major decisions. It was just the obvious. And, and so that's, that's kind of a good answer to, you know, how it works, deeper down. Thank you. Yeah. I uh, still have a question about, uh, very practical, about uh, speaking up, or uh, seeing it's not real. I have the impression if I speak up, like in daily life, family, for example, that it makes things more real. Uh, well, if I choose to, no, I don't know if it's suppressing them, if I choose to uh, go down to the sentence of the lesson, which says, like, if you are upset, do this, uh, repeat this sentence, if I do that, that it gets less real, so I'm now a bit like, okay, do I now need to speak up, or do I now need to go to this inner peace? It's, for me, it now sounds kind of a contradiction. Well, maybe if we, if we look at it in the context of like, speaking up in your family, I think it's, it's more like Jesus is saying, I want you to align with me to be used for miracle working function. And that Jesus is saying, if you allow me and you're willing, I will perform miracles through you. But then he, he says, you, part of that is that you must allow me to tell you where to perform miracles. And the way that that goes is that, that miracles should always be under Jesus' direction because he, he's the way, the truth, the life, the Alpha, the Omega. He, he can, because he accepted the atonement as, it's, as a correction for his mind, he completed his part perfectly in the awakening, and now he's in charge of the plan of atonement, the plan of awakening. And so because Jesus is in that position, we'll say, he can perform miracles indiscriminately. He, he can perform miracles indiscriminately. For those of us that are learning to open up to miracles, we are not in a position to perform miracles indiscriminately. We need to pray. We need to let the miracles come through as He directs. And He knows where that the miracles can come through. And so, oftentimes, that's 
where the struggle really comes in if it's like if, it, if it's with their family and it's the thing that I speak up uh, I don't want to make trouble here or whatever it still comes back to praying to Jesus and asking what am I to, to share what am I to extend you know there's a there is a time and place for everything and and I felt like that was a big key for me because I had with course group, with my parents, with my family, with friends and everything, you know, I was going through some of the same kind of quandaries. Do I speak up or not here? Is there something to say or not? And I came more and more into this awareness like, yeah, that's not something that David needs to figure out. It's I need to, to pray and be inspired and learn to just let things naturally flow through where they're meant to flow through. There's a part in the Course of Miracles where Jesus says, as far as the, the miracle, there's an action component, which is a component with our body, words and actions. And Jesus is like, you must let me be in control of the action component. No, whether to speak up or not. Well, that's, that's an action component, <laughs> right, right there, you see? So, it's when we're trying to solve it in terms of like, solve it on our own, it gets frustrating. It's like, you know, should I, shouldn't I, you know, it's like this. But, but for me, I think more and more, I, I found that there were, different settings and circumstances where it just seemed that it came through very easily and me speaking it just felt just involuntary it felt very easy and natural and in other cases I wasn't really to to say anything or do anything and, and I, I became more resigned to that like oh okay okay I see you see, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't too easy for me at the beginning to speak up with my biological family. You know, it, I'm sure it, it seemed very surprising, but I was very shy. So it's like, oh, now he speaks. Huh. <laughs> What's he speaking about? <laughs> so, you know, but but then there were a lot of new friends I was meeting, and course groups, and different things like this, and it started to feel very natural, and very easy, and very comfortable to even speak in those kind of circumstances. There was like a very large Tuesday night Course in Miracles group that I used to go to, and they would go around and read, like each, each person read a paragraph, and go around the circle and read, and everything. But as soon as I started going there and felt just comfortable and relaxed with everybody like this, they would go read a paragraph and then the next person would read a paragraph and start to go around the room. But then after two, three people reading paragraphs, somebody would raise a question about the paragraph or about the question that they had and then and then I found myself, the Spirit just coming through and answering the question. So then everyone would go, oh, yeah, great, great. Then they go back and read, read more paragraphs until another question came, and then the question would come, and then the Spirit would answer the question very matter-of-factly through me. Oh, that's great, that's great. So this went on Tuesday night after Tuesday night after Tuesday night. <coughs> so. That was the routine. If somebody would show up there, that would be, they would read until there was a question, and then when there was a question, all the heads in the group would just turn on the David character. And? <laughs> like, like it was David the Oracle or something. Like but it would be like a comedy show for people <laughs> to watch, you know. Because it's unlike a lot of horse groups, they, you know, 
said it's kind of bantering. Well, I think this. Well, I think he means this. Well, I disagree. <laughs> this and this. This was kind of the way it was going. So for me, though, that was that was also just a willingness to be pray. I, I would pray before I would go into the group. I'm here only to be truly helpful. I'm here to represent him who sent me. I don't have to worry about what to say, what to do, for he who sent me will direct me. I'm, I'm content to be wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with me. And I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. I was just there as a servant to say, okay, whatever is most helpful. But, but I didn't go into that group thinking, okay, I'm going to be the the answerer, or the group didn't have a facilitator. Either. There was no facilitator of the group, so it's almost like Jesus sent me there to ease me into being spoken through, because I was very shy. And we started to go very deep in that group over over the time frame. I don't know how many months, or I was there for a year and a half, or whatever, but. But it got deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper in that particular Tuesday night course week. Until one night, the, they had brought a bunch of food and we were all in a big circle and the food was all on the table. And we got into such a deep state that I think for a lot of the people in the group, we, we, it was so intimate and so deep that one evening the fear arose and we got to a certain point when I just watched, everybody lunged at the food at the same time. They all went and they dove into the food in them. This is interesting. <laughs> and then after that, it was like, we want this to get back more to the social group that we had before, and where we just read the book and eat the food and enjoy the, you know. And I was like, oh, okay, all right then. And some of them, People, I said, okay, that's good. Group can, that's good. Have your group the way you want it. And then a few people said, we want to get together and go even deeper. It was just a few that were like wanting to. It was too. It was a little getting a little too threatening, you know, to the ego because we were going so deep. But again, we have to be in that place where we're praying to Jesus, just like you direct me if I'm supposed to speak up or. Where you direct me, where you want me to perform your miracles, and Jesus has has talked about it in the notes. Uh, he was talking to Helen Shuckman one time, and he was saying Casey had such a great, a very helpful contribution to the plan of awakening. He just used the last name Casey, meaning Edgar Casey, the most famous psychics and healers on the planet. And he said, then he went on the next sentence and said, Casey could have been much more helpful if he had asked me which miracles to perform. Mm -hmm. Oh, there it is. There it is again. You know, Jesus can perform them indiscriminately and that's why we need to pray, listen, and follow because even the, the healing can only come through in just the way where it can be received. And Jesus knows where it can be received and where it cannot be received. And he, he, he knows that if we try to force a miracle or force a miracle onto somebody and tell somebody something that they're not ready to hear or not ready to experience, that that would increase their fear. And that's, he doesn't ever want to increase the fear. He wants it to come through in a gentle way where it can be received and heard. So that's another version of that. I will step workbook lesson. I will step back and let him lead the way, and that's part of our humbleness that we go deeper into. You know, should I speak up here or not? Should I speak up in my family or not? No. Just ask Jesus. Say, should I speak up here or not? And make it obvious. <laughs> and you know. And that's where you start to develop that connection. And then the awkwardness starts to go away, you know, the, the self-judgment or the awkwardness around the, the question starts to fade away. So it's, it's what it is at a deeper level. 
I tried many times, but not so much with my father, but with my mother. I would go, oh my gosh, we had so many miracles at the Tuesday night course group, and that now she was a Christian woman, you know, raised with more of a traditional Christian church, and she would share, share, and she would change the subject, my dad would change the subject. <laughs> <laughs> wow, how? How high temperature did we reach today? <laughs> we were talking about the miracle. The Reds, the sport team, did they win today? <laughs> did you hear the score? <laughs> Dividing my mother, you know, she said. She said to me, first thing she said was, Dave, I don't need a minister. Okay, and then, you need to find other people to share these things with. And uh, Jesus would say, that's me. Speaking through your mother. You need to let me direct where you bestow your miracles. Don't go try to share them where you believe they're most helpful. <laughs> Mom and Dad need to hear this. No, they don't. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's a surrender. So I will step back and let him lead the way. We live and learn. Like Abby says all the time, it just comes to me, you know, leave your family alone. <laughs> it's always saying that. Leave your family and friends alone. <laughs> it's the focus on the inner work, the inner healing, yeah. I find too, it's, there are signs, like if, if somebody really is curious, they'll ask you. But if they're not curious, then they won't ask about it. So it's, it's pretty obvious. I always felt that, yeah, it's not about trying to convince anybody about anything. If they have a sincere question, they'll ask. Sometimes it starts out with, you really are happy. What's going on in your life? Or something like that, you know, where they notice your attitude. And then they have a natural curiosity that rises sometimes when they ask the question. And maybe it's just one question. When you say something, so that's the end of that. But you know, they're not interested in more. I mean, that's obvious. Too. Yeah. Well. Oh. Well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs> Okay. Shall we have a lunch break? Lunch break, and then also let's keep in mind for the movie mm. tonight. Yeah. So there are two people leaving. Maybe we oh, talk about what you said. Yeah, I was just wondering if we should have the movie in the afternoon instead of in the morning. Mm. Maybe it's too bright. It is very bright in here. Oh, it would be good to have a bit of a pause and change the pace yeah. for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And if you notice that there are any themes, I mean, we have our title, Do Not See Error, so we've really kind of focused in on that mm -hmm. so far. Yeah. Well, maybe another relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone have any strong request or theme that you go through that you want to explore deeper? Maybe I have. I have. And a thought, yeah, about yesterday, when you introduced the movie, you mentioned uh, quite briefly this place where decisions are really made. And uh, it, it resonated in me as very interesting to, to see what is this place um, that I'm unconscious of, where decisions are really made. 
I can't even now. I have, I have lost seemingly my association with this idea, but it, it still remained in my mind, or maybe in our mind. What is this, this uh, subject of decisions in general and this hidden place? It is um, that I make decisions that I'm not conscious about. And mm -hmm. see, because I choose what I see, feel, experience. Right, it's amazing because um, just to to um, not forget that I made it. I I have decided. I have decided about everything mm -hmm. and about the situation. And this place that it is um, and sounded inspiring to me. So, so mm -hmm. just to just to mention it. And maybe what, whatever comes uh, to this subject or this experience. Was, so it, it, it was kind of. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, it, 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 interesting association. Yeah, it was maybe you uh, can remember. Yeah, we were talking too about consciousness and receiving messages from above and below the right mind, yeah, and exactly. the wrong mind, and. Yeah. and how Jesus says actually consciousness is the part of the mind that will induce action. So when we seem to act like it seems to a person like oh, I'm going to decide to do this, go to this retreat, or yeah. spend this money, or buy this thing, that that's more of a, a reflection or an outcome. It's a it's an outcome that comes from a decision that's made, and that decision in the mind is the decision of purpose. I did a little booklet years ago called Purpose is the Only Choice, which was kind of taking, tracing it back from what's on the surface of consciousness yeah. down deep, much deeper to, yeah. to the purpose. And then what seems to happen, what seems to be presented in the world is more of a reflection of the purpose that was chosen. But that's it. It's very, very deep. So it's interesting to, to you know, pray on that to see if we can come up with a, a movie that really shows that in, in a way that, that the purpose is really the most important characteristic of the decision, yeah. not the specific. Yeah, there's a letting go behind it might be because I think I make decisions on the surface. Yeah, yeah or I make them. Guilt comes in, or what, whatsoever is a result. So, and yeah, it's, it sounds interesting. Thank you. Uh, yes. Laura, have a, you have a request? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This the fear of speaking feels so automatic as well, like almost impossible. It's never going to go away. But I was thinking when I shared with you yesterday, and I don't really take much in afterwards because there's all nervousness. And, but I was laying in bed last night, and the message that I got was, and even what people are sharing about people pleasing and not being able to speak up, the, it was littleness. Like, I felt that's what you were saying. Let go of the littleness. Even with this feeling that comes, the fear that comes around. And then I was reading the course this morning. When I first got the course, I'd written quotes in, and I just read this. Your practice must therefore rest upon your willingness to let all littleness go. And release from littleness depends on willingness and not on time. Yeah, that's very impactful. Yeah, yeah that's good. Well, that's good. I'll take that one into prayer for the, the movie. The journey from littleness to magnitude, yeah, in, in a practical way, like a step-by-step -step way in terms of decisions, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I do think of that movie, first when I mentioned to both of you, if there were any whims and everything, you mentioned the movie Lucy. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, Scarlett Johansson plays mm -hmm. Lucy. At the beginning, she's she's in the role of a girlfriend, and 
she's quite shocked by what he's asking of her and what seems to happen to her. She's quite shocked as if it's, she's very afraid. But as the movie progresses, she's not afraid. She becomes more and more confident, more and more tuned in to the power of the mind, the power of decision. Her communication skills become, she's more telepathic and she comes almost like unlocking the power that resides within. So that, that's kind of a rapid journey from littleness to magnitude. Yeah, very good one. Yeah. But we can keep that in mind because those are helpful, those kind of movies are very empowering. It's one of my favorite films. Yes, <laughs> you watch the, the character transformation in there from a frightened girlfriend to uh, the one, <laughs> you know. And then the, the French police detective, you know, who's kind of like amazed by her psychokinesis and the powers of, of her mind, you know. At the end, you know, you know, the phone, I am everywhere, you know, the, where, where is she? Where did she go? I am everywhere, you just, know. <laughs> yeah, it's just huge, it's, but it's, well, that one I will keep an eye on for those kind, because that's very good. At the beginning she was into people pleasing, by the end of the movie, you know, they, they were trying to, the gangsters were trying to shoot her, and they couldn't even shoot her. At the end, she had transcended the possi that, that possibility. Like, it's like, you can shoot my garment, but you can't, you can't shoot me. I mean, she was, yeah, that's good. Good. Okay.